I forget whether it was Frank Marshall or Steven Spielberg said, we're going to make you famous. <laughs> and in the 1990s, cockroaches, uh, beetles, butterflies paid for my house. If you've wanted yet feared to do work that is weird, this is the show you just need to hear. Let's say you're filming a movie and you need someone covered in bees. You don't want to use CGI. You want that authentic bee look. But you have a big name actor in that bee suit. Like, oh, I don't know, Matt fucking Damon? If you're the director, there's really only one person to call. Hollywood's resident bug wrangler, Stephen Kutcher. And Stephen's wrangled everything. From that spider that turned Peter Parker into Spider-Man, to a swarm of locusts in Exorcist 2, to all those bees that covered Matt Damon in We Bought a Zoo. And he does all of this without so much as hurting a fly. Now let's listen to them speak about their jobs, which are quite unique. Weird work. So first question I just got to ask, do you personally have a favorite bug? Uh, my favorite bug is the one that, I, that I'm working with currently. And that could be anything. So I love them all. I really don't have a favorite. It's just fun to work with them. People say, if I'm working with 40,000 ants, which I've done, they say, do you name all your ants? And I say, yes. And they say, what's the name of that ant? And I say, Mary. And they say, what's the name of that ant? And I say, Mary. And then they say, how do you know you got all your ants back? And I say, I count their legs and divide by six. Standard, standard bug jokes. Yeah. So what got you interested in entomology to begin with? Well, I was born in New York in Manhattan, grew up in the Bronx, New York. And every summer we'd go to the Catskill Mountains where there are fireflies and blueberries and wild strawberries and fish and and for the first five years of my life during the summer, I was inundated with nature. Then we'd go back to the city, and that's where I started doing artwork, you know, at a very early age. And that inspired me to later on uh, follow that trail and become a naturalist. And then I discovered what an entomologist was. And I said, oh, cool, you can study bugs inside your house and you can study bugs out in nature. And that's what I did. So so you it sounds like you've had kind of a lifelong passion for insects and bugs. Oh, you can't live without bugs. <laughs> I mean, okay, so you must have come across this early in your life. Like, what about people who don't like bugs? Well, there are two aspects of that. When you're young and you have those relatives or people who want to pinch your cheek, you say, do you want to see my spider? And then they they back off from you. And later <laughs> on, later on, when I in high school, of course, I wasn't the most popular kid, you know, but I had my insects and I had, you know, I went out to the mountains and later on, I'd get these calls. And now as a professional from people who are afraid of insects, and that's very common. And I'd like to help them with their fear. So I reverse it. Because one of the things I've found is that when people are afraid, they, they have a lack of knowledge. So I can give them that knowledge, which is power, and then they're not as afraid. So if you, you feel like you coach through a lot of people throughout your whole life, where you're helping them get over their fear of insects. Yes, from the very famous, and I can't mention their names, to people who, who, who are interested. But one thing in common, you have to want to overcome your fear or you won't. So that's sort of how you got into bugs and insects. What was the first Hollywood project that you worked on? Well, that was an interesting story because I had graduated with my master's degree and I was looking for teaching jobs. And my major professor uh, came to me and said, uh, there's a movie and they want somebody to take care of 10,000 African locusts. Huh. And he knew that I dealt with the public well and that I, I loved insects and I was always doing odd things. And it turned out to be 3,000 African locusts and we had to check them to make sure they were all males. And that was The Exorcist too. 
And this is before they had all the digital things they could do now. Yeah. And um, so for six months, I, I, I had these eight foot by eight foot cages that I kept the grasshoppers in, the locusts in. I fed them 80, 80 flats of rye grass and I'd walk in the cage and people would look at me. And it was just a lot of fun. And I thought after that movie was over, I met Richard Burton and Linda Blair and James Earl Jones and all kinds of people. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was the end of that experience. Then the next thing that happened was the assistant director said, I'm working on Wonder Woman with Linda Carter and we need ads because he remembered my work. And then I did. Uh, so my very first two movies were a big feature and a number one show at that time. So that just catapulted you into the industry as like the bug guy. No, it kind of went downhill. <laughs> um. Can you explain for for people listening what the scene in The Exorcist 2 looks like? Okay. So in The Exorcist 2, the the devil manifests itself as a swarm of locusts. So these locusts would attack things. They would attack houses and cornfields and people and that was part of the the story. And that's that's how I got involved with that movie. And actually in the book, The Making of the Exorcist 2, there's a picture of a whole bunch of people with with grasshoppers in their hand. I I don't throw anything out. So after the grasshoppers died, because they don't live that long, um, and you don't want to kill any of them because you want to use them, but yeah. they would die because uh, they were they, you know, you don't know their ages. I would put them in the freezer. So we had all these dead locusts, and then there was a scene where they were supposed to splat against a wall. Yeah. So I took the dead locusts, thawed them out, and with a syringe, injected them with studio blood, and gave them to all the people, and we're all throwing them against the wall. There's a picture in that book of, of that. <laughs> That's so funny. So <laughs> you are individually going around to these frozen locusts with a syringe, injecting them with blood, and then giving them to staff members to huck at a wall? Is that basically right. it? Right. That's fantastic. <laughs> it was. Today, they'd never do that. They'd see me in. So <laughs> how did you bill for the, like, how do you bill for something like this, having tons and tons of locusts? Okay, so there, let me divide that into two parts. The first part is I studied insect behavior. I studied how insects behave. So that's how I could get this work. Yeah. When I realized that one out of, in the 1980s, I realized that one out of every three films had an insect in it, I saw the work potential. And then because of my background in insect behavior, I could outcompete the animal trainers who did dogs and chickens and squirrels. So they but were your competition. They were my competition, but they didn't know how to do all the bug tricks I knew how to do. Okay. But to answer your question about how much do I charge, I tell my students this, you have to know how much you're worth. If I'm going to hire you, do I hire you for $10 an hour or 20 or 50 or 100 or $200 an hour? You have to decide what you want. In the early days, I was just amazed to get any money at all to play with bugs. I yeah, mean, I know. Paid. This is this. I feel like this must be very exciting for you in the early days because you're like a recent college grad and your professor's like, do you want to work on this huge movie? When I had reached my peak, I was making like $1,000 a day to collect butterflies. So I'd go out and collect butterflies and it was just fun. I mean, it was <laughs> worth doing. <laughs> And then in 1990, I did Arachnophobia, a really big movie for me, because I oversaw all the spiders. I saw that I went through the script. I worked with all the actors. And um, in 1990, the uh, I forget whether it was Frank Marshall or Steven Spielberg said, we're going to make you famous. <laughs> and in the 1990s, cockroaches... Uh, beetles, butterflies paid for my house. That's so like the night was the nineties, like the heyday of insects for you. Oh yes. And I remember getting snails from my parents' house because they, th my father did not like insects that much. Yeah. And they would kill the snails and I go, you just killed $15 worth of snails. So 
I would I learned where to get things, and that's also a big change that's occurred because growing up and in the 1990s, there were a lot more places and open fields to collect things. Now everything is so litigious and and everything is fenced off. There aren't as many places to collect and explore as I had. So I guess it's like it sounds like over the 80s and 90s, you're really building up your name as the bug person in Hollywood, the bug guy in Hollywood. Yeah, there really wasn't too much competition then, except that when I started to get really, because I've worked on over 100 features, when I started to really be out there, everybody else all of a sudden put insects in. So they used to say, we do elephants you know, monkeys, dogs, cats. Oh, all the animal trainer people. The animal trainer people. And then they would add an insects. Oh, they, okay. They, <laughs> they saw what I was doing. And so now there's lots of competition, but uh, they don't know what I know. And I have a really good reputation and I can do things that they can't do most of the time. Um, I worked on arachnophobia, cold heaven, copycat. Dracula that was done with Francis Coppola, The Exorcist 2, which I mentioned. Matilda, which we we did Newts. Oh, Newt's nice. Night, Nightmare in Elm Street, Pacific Heights, Tarantulas in Wild Wild West, Race the Sun, Spider-Man. I did the original Spider-Man. Teenage Werewolf 2 is one of my favorite little scenes. I use uh, forward flies. They're, the guy's supposed to open up fleas, uh, release fleas in the classroom. And you, you're not, you don't want to do that. But I knew about these little flies that would jump just like fleas and they're about the size of fleas. And so I collected those. So that's an example of something I would, I would know. Which out of, out of those movies, what's, what was your favorite scene? Uh, having uh, the spiders come out of the sink in arachnophobia is really a cool shot. Yeah, I've seen th- that's the one where it's like it's just a shot of the plain white sink and then like 20 spiders start pouring out of it, right? Right. And what we had was we invented all these things. So we invented a spider pusher and these spiders can live together and tolerate each other. And we put them in the spider pusher. And then when they wanted them to come out, we just uh, push them out. I also did something like that in. And Fright Night Part Two, which is also another cool scene, they actually have a dummy, a mannequin with a rubber stomach, and I had a huge plunger full of all kinds of insects, and they had four guys controlling this dummy, and so the dummy collapses against the wall, it looks like a real person. Hmm. They put uh, slits in the rubber stomach, and then I push the plunger out, and all the bugs pour out of the stomach. It is really great. Oh. Even with today's technology, you can't beat that. I mean, I'm going to be honest, like these are incredible scenes. I'm very impressed. But even just hearing about that makes me a little, a little bit uncomfortable. (laughs) Well, that's why they hired me. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I mean, you're doing a great job. These are like those scenes, especially the ones with the bugs coming out of the sink. It's like you can't forget them once you've seen them. And then I I immediately went it like I went to the bathroom afterwards and just stared (laughs) at my sink and I was like oh my god what if it happens to me? (laughs) Oh yeah, I I if we had five days I could talk about arachnophobia and all the things we did. It it was it was an incredible experience. That's so what I, I guess like how many bugs are in your house right now? Like in terms of living ones and dead ones. Well, I used to have about 60 containers. I have fewer now, but I'll just say that right now I have about 13 tarantulas, different types, because um, I really don't have that many, that much live stuff. I have a butterfly garden outside. I rely more than the world we live in. A lot of people breed things, so I rely on those breeders rather than getting it myself. But if I have to go out and get it myself, I am really a great collector. And then I know people who breed different butterflies and or they might have some things that are more exotic and I know where to get them. So that's that's what I use. But but actually, you know, I tell people I make my living by by having a fly walk around on a table and watching it because I learned so much from the fly that I can use that. 
I can fly a fly on a string. I can put it on a fly powered airplane. I can make it uh, clean itself on cue. I can make it fly in a circle. I can make it walk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I've never been able to train a dog to do any of those things, so that's pretty <laughs> impressive. I've never even made, and that's like they do that a lot. That's kind of their average thing is to work with humans. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess now that we're talking about kind of the different bugs that you can get and all the things you can do with bugs, with. CGI becoming like so much more popular in movies. What's your take on transitioning uh, to CGI for a lot of things in Hollywood? Well, I'll tell you a big problem with CGI. Uh, if CGI was so great, they wouldn't need actors, animals, anything, because they could create anything in a virtual world. Uh, there's one big thing that's missing. So let's say they needed butterflies to fly. Well, if you don't know how butterflies fly, and if you don't have that environment where the butterfly is gonna go, the people who generate these things don't know that, and they basically just make what appears to them what a butterfly looks like, and they don't realize the effect of wind, heat, shadows yeah. on the butterfly and how it flies. Yeah. So if they use a butterfly from South America and the scene is supposed to be shot in New York, they'll say they don't, they won't, no one will notice yeah. except the experts and it, real filmmakers don't do that. So I guess, do you ever advise people on CGI effects or do you not like work in that area at all? I think um, uh, I may have once or twice, but I try to avoid it. Um, hmm. But they're my biggest competition. So when I go on a, a and I just was working on a feature. When I go on a feature, they uh, are there saying, well, we can do everything. But they can, but can they do everything well? Can they do everything that looks as good as natural? Can a swarm of bees that they generate look as good as real bees, which I can do? Can the computer-generated bees look better than the real bees? The real bees will look better and that's what I use. And that's why good directors and good movies will go with the real bees. And there's another aspect of, of working with live things, the organicness of it. People who tend to CG tend to go in a straight line. They yeah. don't know about the organic things that might happen, things that you don't expect that make things appear to be real because they are real and they're wonderful. Like, can you give me an example of that? Okay. So when they computer generate butterflies, if they're not good, they make the wings flap. Like if you put your hands together in prayer and then open and close them, uh -huh. um, then that's how they make butterflies. So just like a like folding a piece of paper and opening and closing it because it opens and closes. But if you know how butterflies fly, they don't fly like that at all. Their wings act like sails and they're curved and they kind of swim through the air. And so when I see this, uh, um, I know that they're not real butterflies. That's so, so man, so you just seem to be constantly curious. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you like an what? absolute tinkerer. Like it, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but somebody just kind of gives you a problem. We need pink butterflies. I need insects to do this thing. I need them to walk into a shoe. And then they just go solve it. And then you have to come up with whatever that solution is, however you can. The difference between science and working in the film industry is in science, you go through, and I'm trained scientist, you go through a scientific method and then you do your research. It's peer, it's looked at by peers, eventually gets in a publication, then it goes to a book. And that takes a long time. In the film industry, you have to solve it tomorrow. So I learned one of my skills was problem solving. And I'm very good at problem solving. And so any of those things you mentioned, how do you make the bugs do that, was something I would do. The movies you work on, generally the bugs are scary. And I'm wondering if you ever worry that kind of the films that you're working on are demonizing insects and making us a lot more scared of them than we need to be. Oh, of course. 
And, you know, I hear that criticism and they say, well, bugs really don't do that. And, and I say, you know, when you watch film, and this is kind of amazing about human beings, human beings actually pay money to be frightened. They go, <laughs> go to a scary movie. <laughs> they know it's going to be a scary movie and they pay money to be frightened. And so what I remind people is, that these films, they're for entertainment. They're not scientific films. You're not watching a documentary. You're watching some, you're watching entertainment. That's why it's called the entertainment business. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't mind doing that. And besides, it gives me more work because first I frighten them and then I cure them. I get it on both sides. <laughs> Are you are you like the buzzkill on those like planning sessions where they're like, let's have the ants like all run together. And you're like, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, I, I remember I did a got milk commercial and I looked at the script. And this is one of the things I do that people don't realize. I looked at the script and I said, you can do this. You, can, you can't do that. I do a script breakdown. I tell them how long it takes to film it, um, which ones are easy to film, which scenes are easy to film, which scenes are hard to film. So I do a breakdown and then I give them alternatives. So I say, okay, you can't do this, but you can do this. So that's actually something I, I really do that, that makes a difference. So I'd like to transition a little bit into talking about your bug art. How did you get into bug art? Um, in the 1980s, I was working on a commercial. Steven Spielberg was executive producing for amazing stories. And they asked me to make a fly walk through ink and leave fly footprints. I didn't know how to do it, but I figured it out. Then in 2003, I met somebody who was doing a, a art show and I told her that story. So uh, what happened was uh, I decided I'd try to make insect art. And the first thing I was gonna do was put shoes on the insect's feet. Because I saw when I took an insect and I dipped it in paint and put it on paper, it was tiny little specks because their feet are tiny. So I figured if I may put shoes on them, there'd be bigger footprints. Yeah. Well, well, I didn't have to do that because I came up with a better idea of using wet paper and concentrated pigment. The paint I use is water soluble, so it doesn't harm the insect. I, I wash it off afterwards. But... It, when you take a little drop of concentrated pigment and put it on wet paper, it expands and you can see the footprints across the room. So when I saw that and realized that there are a million insects, um, I saw the potential there. And in fact, one of my goals is to make the largest possible piece of artwork that I can. And I'm guessing it's going to be about 10 feet by 20 feet. And Whoa. it's going to and it's going to be made by tiny little insect footprints that you can see from across the room. Do you work with only one type of insect for this at work, or are you working with multiple types of insects? I've done 12 different ones. I did one with a tarantula, one with a scorpion, but I like working with hissing cockroaches, darkling beetles. Those are my favorite because they're hardy, they're easy, they're long-lived, and they're the best to work with. I noticed looking through your pieces, it's very interesting to see all like the idiosyncrasies of the way insects work. That's what I found particularly appealing. Like they don't walk in straight lines. They're kind of all over the place. Like, but you're, you're able to get them to at least go in a direction. But like, it seems like sometimes they drag their feet. Sometimes they don't. And you, and you see a lot of that come out on the piece. Yes, and I, I can guide them. It's just a fun thing to do. You start out with a blank piece of paper. You don't know what go, it's going to end up being. And then you get some ideas. And then the insects are going to give you some ideas. And then it's a combination of using my science, my art background, and the insect itself. And you end up with a beautiful piece. My living room is covered with artwork. And I just love looking at it. And I guess what reaction are you trying to bring out of people when they see this work? Well, that's a great question because there are two parts to this one. The people who say, um, I show them a piece of my artwork or they see it for the first time. And the very first question is, does it hurt the bugs? And I know that those people don't understand what I'm doing and I have to explain to them. And the other type of person looks at it and go, this is beautiful. I've never seen anything like this before. 
Yeah. Those are the people I resonate more with. But for the first people, what I try to do is let them understand the connection of nature and how habitat is disappearing and how insects are disappearing and diversity is disappearing. And I would not be able to paint, for example, if there were no insects alive on the earth, which will never happen. But uh, I want them to understand the importance of insects. And that's one of the ways I use my artwork. But it seems to me like the things that you do with art is sort of making a lot of that invisible world of bugs seem a lot more real and visible to people. I think the difference with creativity is that people see things, but but the creative person is able to see beyond that and do something about it. I, I have this vision of these giant beetles walking in the sky and their footprints are clouds. And so I look up at the sky and I see those clouds and go, oh, there might, maybe there's a giant insect up there leaving <laughs> these footprints. So I guess let's say you're behind the camera. Let's say you're writing the script and you want, what would be like the, the best possible bug scene that you would want to film? Well, one movie I want to make is about two ants that drive a little red convertible. And instead of doing it in animation or CG, they're going to be done with real ants and a real red three-quarter inch convertible. So who are these Who are these two ants and what are they doing in a convertible? The, well, one ant, the story is one ant um, uh, never has any adventures in their life, works as a bean counter, as an accountant, uh, counts beans. And the other one is an adventurous ant. So the adventurous ant's going to take the, the non-adventurous ant on a journey to see different things. And they go to the airport and see fly-powered airplanes and things like that. Does your ant, who's like an accountant, what's prompting him to leave the hive? I think he just got tired of counting beans. <laughs> like like he just, this ant just snaps one day. He's yeah. talking to his fun, adventurous ant. And that ant's like, leave it all behind. And he's like, okay, great. And then they hop in a red convertible and just start drive it off. Yes. And the cameras are getting so miniaturized that now you can attach a camera to a beetle and that beetle will walk around and you'll see the POV of the beetle view through the camera. So this, this movie could be shot all POV. <laughs> well, I don't know about ant size, but but I, you know, this if is, we're at I'm, beetle, like ant is the next step, though. Right. Well, <laughs> the Department of Defense is working on these miniature uh, robot things that you can fly through windows that are the size of insects. Horrifying, but yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's why I have screens on all my windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not only just getting like covering up the camera on your computer. Now we have to make sure that government ant creatures don't fly in government robot right. ants. Right. I would hope yeah. they would meet my favorite insect, the scorpion. I feel uh -huh. like that thing is a bizarre creature. <laughs> well, I actually have a scorpion named after me, Neobuthus kutcheri. You have your own scorpion. Yeah, I have my own scorpion. <laughs> oh, man, dude, how did you not tell me that? That's awesome. So it, actually, if you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, animals named after famous people, there's a huge list. And you're on list. that list? No, I'm not on that list. I am in <laughs> Wikipedia, but I'm not on that list. Um, I think, you know, I could talk about this issue for a long time, how to use insects in film. But I think the thing that I think insects are so fascinating and the, the miniature world of insect is so exciting that if you combine that with a human's face, where you focus on the insect and then on the human's face and their reaction to the insect, I think that's a very powerful image. Yeah. Where can listeners find your work? I have two websites, uh, bugsaremybusiness.com, just the way it's spelled. And... Um, bugartbystephen.com, where you can see the, the bug art work. And then if you go online and type in my name, Stephen Kutcher and Bugs, you'll see a lot of uh, links to different movies and, and projects that have been made and things that I've made. Well, this has been so awesome talking to you. I just want to say, like, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Okay, thanks. Thanks. 
I'm back. Thanks for listening. I really love hearing from you guys, so be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcast. And if you know someone with a weird job, we want to be best friends. Send us an email at hello at weirdworkpodcast.com. Thanks. Bye.